Hi everybody, this is uh, Frank Phillips and I have the uh, privilege of moderating this discussion about uh, I think what's a, a very interesting and uh, current topic in terms of uh, where spine surgery is going. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and interest in uh, single position lateral surgery and uh, for me the ability to access L5, S1 and L4, 5 anteriorly um, has been a great advantage in my practice. It's expedited my efficiency and uh, made my surgeries go quite smoothly. Uh, we're fortunate today to have two experts in the field, two access surgeons, which I know is a little unusual for a spine uh, webinar, but given the partnership that's necessary to successfully accomplish lateral anterior surgery at 4.5 and 5.1, I think we need to clo work closely with these access surgeons. And we have two on this uh, webinar who are both extremely experienced at accessing both L4-5 and L5-S1 naturally. So I'd like to welcome Vanita Chandra, who's at Stanford Health, and Lenny Stubbs, who's out of Oklahoma Heart Hospital, both of whom extremely experienced in these techniques. To lead us off is Vanita Chandra, and I will turn it over to you, Vanita. So thanks, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here virtually or audibly, whatever the word is. Um, my name is Benita Chandra. I'm a vascular surgeon at Stanford, and I've been, uh, I do a fair number of access surgeries, ALIFs, uh, both supine as well as lateral or ex ALIFs, um, for many years now. And um, I have to say, I've become a, a fan. Um, I've been drinking the Kool Aid, so to speak. And there's a couple of reasons why I'm in particularly uh, believe that um, lateral ALIFs or ex ALIFs uh, makes a lot of sense. And I'm really only speaking today about the access surgeon's perspective. I really, you know, don't want to weigh in on all uh, the considerations from the spine standpoint. But as I got more facile with the technique, I realized there's a couple of uh, particularly uh, beneficial aspects um, for me. Um, some of those um, obviously include just the overall facilitation of the single position surgery and efficiency in the operating room obviously expect, um, affects all of us. Uh, I think the ergonomic uh, impact is actually really uh, one that I um, pay a particular and a growing amount of interest in. You know, that's a picture of me um, and then a picture of one of our spine surgeons. Um, and the picture of me on the left-hand side is me doing a supine nailif, and I do them all the time, but you can just see uh, my neck position um, and then the difference in terms of the a nice seated position and being able to raise the bed to eye level. And I, and I really cannot stress this enough for me, particularly on heavier patients, this can make a big difference, um, a lot less strain on my body. And actually that brings up another point and feel free, Frank, to stop me here along the way. But I think um, there's a lot of patients um, or situations and indications for lateral or ex ALIF. And if you look at slide four, it talks a little bit about them, but I think um, one of the key uh, benefits is in particularly in heavier patients. And if you've been an access surgeon or probably any kind of surgeon, we know that there's heavy patients and then there's heavy patients. Um, my sort of telltale sign for a really easy lateral ALIF is a, if you have the patient lay back um, and they have a really big panis but sort of just spreads onto the table as opposed to just staying really sky high. Um, those big panaces staying sky high, Lenny, and I'm sure you see a lot of those, um, so feel free to weigh in. Those are difficult no matter what position, um, but I think slightly easier on the lateral position. Um, and the ones that just spread onto the bed are dramatically easier in the lateral position. So, Vanita, thanks for uh, that interesting lead in. Um, I agree with you. Our experience has been very similar to yours. We really haven't found high BMI to be an issue in terms of performing a lateral ALIF. Uh, as you point out, the uh, large side size actually tends to facilitate access in the lateral position where a lot of the belly tends to fall away from you. So I would, uh, I would agree. I don't think a high BMI uh, is necessarily a contraindication. It may even be an advantage of going laterally uh, for ALIS surgery. So um, on the aspect of patient selection, if you look at slide five, actually there's some more information. You know, I, I do think more so than regular supine ALIFs, and um, you really have to, as the access surgeon, 
pay a lot of attention to the vascular anatomy before the surgery. At least I do. I pay, um, I look at the MRI and CT scan myself. I really pay attention to the, the iliac vein uh, anatomy. And um, I weigh in on the decision-making process often for these patients with the spine surgeon in terms of what position makes the most sense. This just demonstrates one of uh, why this lateral position is so beneficial, particularly in heavier set people. The highlighted peritoneum in purple uh, in the supine position on the left-hand side and then on the lateral position, you could just, just see that gravity does most of the dissection for you, so it really makes it a lot more simple. Uh, Vanita, you run a full-time vascular clinic, you're a busy surgeon. Why have you decided to do ALF access, um, and how and why is that a critical part of your uh, everyday practice, practice as a vascular surgeon? So I, um, as you said, um, Frank, I, uh, I run a full-time vascular surgery practice. And I think a question a lot of people ask is why I have um, such a heavy A-lift practice uh, um, in, uh, included within my practice. And there's a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I, I work in an academic setting. And quite honestly, um, anterior or supine A-lift exposure is good old-fashioned retroperitoneal aorta iliac exposure. And so from the standpoint of training of young surgeons, uh, especially in an era where we're doing less and less open procedures, there's this added benefit of getting them really comfortable in the retroperitoneum and with these exposures when they're perhaps not doing as much open vascular surgery in this uh, location. So that's one of the benefits. Another benefit, um, you know, I, I just think they're fun, quite honestly. It's, it's, you know, a pretty straightforward operation unless it's not. Um, and um, again, has that aspect of good old fashioned open vascular surgery. I do think, though, despite them being relatively straightforward most of the time, they can be quite challenging. And when they are challenging, it really uh, demands of me all of my tools and, and skills as a vascular surgeon or as an access surgeon. You know, when, the, when you're doing redos or when there's an unanticipated amount of scar or when there's such a slip that there's such tension on the vessels that you're really struggling to, to mobilize them, these are situations where you have to slow down and really take advantage of your uh, vascular training, and it's, you know, satisfying. And I think the last thing is, is it's, you know, I, I'm able to slide these in, in between a lot of my cases, and then there's a huge satisfaction because it really seems, at least from the feedback I get from my spine surgeons, to make a huge impact. I mean, we're really helping these patients, and being able to provide that anterior approach seems to really make a significant clinical benefit. So I'll turn this over to you, Lenny. Thanks, Frank. Um, my name is Dr. Lenny Stubbs. Um, I'm a vascular surgeon in Oakland City. Uh, I've been doing uh, both vascular surgery as well as uh, access surgery for uh, or since 2004. Um, the majority of my uh, practice up to probably two or three years ago in the access portion has been uh, doing supine A-lifts. And, and I'm in a community practice, uh, and I go to several hospitals uh, to work with several different spine surgeons. So I get a wide variety of surgeons, um, point of views, and also, you know, varying techniques and, and ideas about approaching the spine. Um, but I do also carry a full load of vascular surgery. And um, the probably the last two to three years, two years, a little over two years maybe, um, we, I started doing the, the lateral access, and um, the idea that Dr. Brawley and I uh, carried when we started this was, and, and considering performing the lateral approach, uh, and the mantra that we actually still say to this day when we do a case or when we're teaching this, this technique is, if you can do it supine, you can do it lateral. Um, and so the same considerations and contraindications to performing the supine lift really apply to the lateral a lift, and there's really not a reason uh, that you can't do the a lift in the lateral position. Um, if, if someone says, why not do it in the spine position, you can certainly do it in the lateral position. It's really just orientation. Um, and for us, I think that, and, and, and Dr. Chandra uh, touched on this uh, very well, the communication and planning of the surgery is key. Uh, the communication between spine surgeon and access surgeon is paramount for evaluating the cases, for evaluating appropriate candidates, and uh, uh, to evaluate who's a good candidate for a retroperitoneal approach. So um, 
for, from my opinion, uh, the axis surgeon should be pretty well versed in, in retroperitoneal approach in the spine position before trying the lateral approach. Uh, and, and secondly, reviewing the images and knowing the potential uh, relative and absolute contraindications for a retroperitoneal approach is, I think, in my opinion, paramount. So the two big keys uh, for me adopting this and, and moving forward with doing these uh, is patient history and radiographic images. Um, Dr. Chandra also said this beautifully, and I think this is really the, the probably one of the main caveats for an axis surgeon is the lateral position really gives you an advantage in terms of the abdominal content falling away from the spine and making, making that retroperitoneal dissection easier, especially in terms of on, in our heavier patients where, you know, the BMIs are, are approaching 35, 40, 45, even, you know, I've, I've had experiences of doing them above 50 in a spine position. That lateral approach really helps, and you can just see the, the peritoneal contents fall away. We have been doing these now for a couple of years, uh, and, and even and pushing the boundaries of going above the five-one level. Uh, but the dissection, and in fact, what I often say when I finish that lateral approach uh, portion of my the portion that I'm performing for the for the spine surgeon is is this it? And I say that a lot. Is this it? This is all I have to do as compared to the supine position where there's a lot more work, there's a lot more potential for peritoneum disruption for bowel contents, et cetera. Uh, the lateral position just makes it easier. So when, it, when we talk about how to make a, a, a case go smoothly, again, the history is important, uh, knowing if they had like a prior A-lift at the same level or adjacent level, radiation therapy, kidney transplant, vascular stents, et cetera. Those things are extremely important. And again, reviewing the film. So when we first started doing the lateral lay lift, we chose cases that were fairly straightforward and easy. So we chose thinner patients with wide open iliac bifurcations, which means there's no vessels around the 5-1 disc space. Um, and we did several of those to actually get up to speed and, and, and learn the dissection and learn the anatomy and learn the orientation of the spine. And once we got comfortable with that, then we started to pick those harder cases where uh, there were low bifurcations where the iliac vein crosses right over the L5-S1 disc space level. Um, and we figured out that, you know, we could do those cases just as easily, if not even easier, than those supine cases. Um, a couple of other things that I've noticed um, that can be problems, whether you're supine or lateral, uh, is annual hernia repairs. I come across those quite a bit. Um, the laparoscopic hernia repair where that mesh is in that pre-peritoneal or retroperitoneal space can pose an issue, and, and you simply have to just know where that dissection plane is. But being in the lateral position, it's easier to actually dissect those contents away from the mesh than actually in the spine position. So uh, in my opinion, again, the communication between the spine surgeon and reviewing the history, reviewing uh, the uh, films is, is really key in, in doing these types of uh, procedures. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, you know, in, talk, in terms of, you know, making sure that when you're doing the case, managing the complications, if you run into those, they're no different really from the supine position other than the fact that the, the incision is smaller. Now, we always say you can make the incision bigger, especially when you first start doing this type of approach because safety is the most important thing. Visualization is, is extremely paramount. But as you, your incision becomes smaller and smaller, uh, having ad additional things in the operating room, such as longer needle drivers, longer clip pliers, potentially a knot pusher if the incision's you know small, uh, if you need a tie suture, those are all things that you know I've I've adopted and, and put into our operating rooms uh, when we're doing these cases uh, for any type of potential potential vessel repair. But again, the mantra is always be safe, and you can always make the incision bigger if you need to. Um, so, uh, and the last thing I'll say about the lateral position, you know, for adopting this technique, and it's not just the lateral lay lift, but also the single position surgery, the spine surgeon obviously has to be comfortable with performing, you know, that portion of the surgery. But yeah, what I've found in, in, in talking to folks around the country, that probably the biggest rate limiting step to adopting this is the access to the spine and having a surgeon that is comfortable uh, doing this type of approach. Um, so, you know, making sure that, that 
access surgeons are comfortable doing this approach. It really is getting a mindset of being in that lateral position, being 90 degrees perpendicular to where you normally are. Um, and then the other thing I would like to say is in terms of workflow, when we adopted this uh, procedure, I noticed there was, you know, a lot of advantages from not only from the access surgeon, but just in general workflow in the operating room. There's been a, a couple of times where I've actually not been able to show up for the anterior approach. Uh, I've been late, and our spine surgeon, Dr. Brawley, has actually started the posterior proportion of the screws in the lateral position. Then I show up and do the, lateral, the anterior approach, and then he finishes the backside without ever having to move the patient. So, um, again, uh, not, only, not only are we talking about lateral access, but when, when, you, when you start adopting that single position surgery, that workflow is much faster. It's less time in the operating room. And also what I've been told by our spine surgeons is postoperatively for the lateral a lift, there's a shorter time in the, uh, in the hospital. There's less pain. A lot of the folks that, and with supine a lift, when you're going medial to the rectus muscle, they complain of a lot of rectus muscle pain. And we're not seeing that in the lateral a lift. Um, and it, it, in terms of expanding indications for the L5-S1 uh, disc face level, those higher BMIs that Dr. Chandra talked about, it makes it a, a lot easier to achieve uh, access to in those patients because, again, that, that abdominal, the abdominal cancer contents just fall away. So uh, that's kind of my thoughts about lateral lay lift and adopting this and making sure when you do these cases, you're safe uh, and, but you, and you have good exposure for the spine surgeon to actually perform the, the anterior fusion. I had two points that I wanted to bring up after um, uh, your uh, really great uh, points, Lenny. Uh, one, and I'm just curious your opinion. Um, I went into the aspect of uh, doing lateral ailifts with a very significant amount of supine ailif exposure experience. I do think that helped me a lot, um, just in terms of understanding anatomy. It's really the same thing, except the patient's on their side. Um, but uh, the ex view and the, the degree of exposure is a little bit more uh, focused in a lateral ALF. So I personally thought it was very helpful. I don't know, Lenny, if you have any thoughts on, on that one um, point. And I, uh, the other point I want to bring up before I forget it is another aspect that I do think is important is um, a continued communication between the access surgeon and the spine surgeon. Unlike in supine ailifts, where usually, not always, but usually when you put the retractors into position, everything is pretty stable. Um, the vessels aren't, you know, dying to slip out from under the retractors. In the lateral position, however, particularly the left iliac vein, because of gravity, it can easily slip under. And because, as you can imagine, there's a lot of motion during the, um, you know, placement of the cage, et cetera. Um, so that is something that I'm always very aware of, and I'm constantly communicating with the spine surgeon. This is where it is. If you see anything move, you know, please call me, or I stay in the operating room for those cases, which I, when I don't always for the supine A-lifts. I think having supine A-lift experience is, is paramount before you can start doing lateral A-lifts because knowing the relationships, knowing the anatomy, knowing the branches that potentially are there when you turn a person 90 degrees for the first time and see them in a lateral position, I think those vessels sometimes may be a little confusing at first. Um, but if you've done a, a fair number of supine A-lifts, you, you already know where everything should be living. And obviously reviewing those, those films can, can obviously give you that anatomy uh, so you kind of know what you're getting into. But knowing where you're going uh, in that retroperitoneal dissection is, is key. Uh, knowing where that ureter is going to be when you start pulling the peritoneum over uh, at 5-1 and knowing that, knowing, hey, I need to be beware that the ureter is right there or that the iliac vein or that the, there could be a branch here coming off uh, that, that iliac vein going down into the sacrum. Those kind of things, those little nuances, you only can get through experience. So having that, uh, for instance, in your case, having that, 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 that vast exposure of supine a lift certainly helps you when you then turn a patient 90 degrees. So I think that's very important. And I don't think, honestly, that uh, an access surgeon should start off just doing lateral. I think they should have some supine 
uh, experience and exposure in that anatomy and see that anatomy clearly laying flat before they get into that limited exposure. Because you're, you're absolutely right. You're limited and you're actually just exposing really the, the disc base level and maybe a little bit of the vertebral body. Uh, but you need to know what lives behind those retractors because when you pull that retractor away, if something is it goes awry, you know what, what you're dealing with. I always stay in the operating room and watch when we're doing that, and I'm kind of looking over his shoulder. And certainly if, there, if, the, if it's a wide open L5S1, there's no vessels anywhere to be found, um, you know, you're, you can probably relax a little more. But if there's, if there's that low bifurcation where that left iliac vein is actually coming right over the top of the, the L5S1, and when you retract it, you can see the tension on that, that, that iliac vein. Um, we call it vein creep. I think most people do. I think they call it vein creep, Cre creeping under the retractor. The first thing I always tell the spine surgeon when I get up out of my chair to let him in to do the discectomy is be, be aware of the veins right there. So if you see it coming up under the retractor, let me know. The other thing in those cases, I typically probably it's it, people have mixed opinions on it, but I typically use a pin to pin that retractor against the spine so that there's less motion. And I pin it on the inferior aspect away from the vein. That helps. Now, it doesn't prevent the vein from creeping superiorly underneath that retractor, but it doesn't, when, when they put the, the uh, spacers or trials in and it pushes that spine away from the retractor, if you pin it to the spine, there's less vein creep. There's less ability for that vein to creep around. But I completely agree that communication, even if you have a big vein on the other side, the right iliac vessel is close by and say, hey, if you re adjust that bottom retractor, because a lot of times our spine surgeon will do that, he'll adjust that, that, that posterior retractor, that bottom retractor, I'll say, beware, there's a vein under there. Just don't get too carried away when you readjust it. So absolutely, and that, that goes supine, that goes lateral, you know, communication during the case is absolutely paramount to make sure you don't run into some, even when they're doing the discectomy and you're, they have the knife in their hand, and you say, be careful, the vein's right there. Um, that, that makes for a great case. And if you don't communicate, it can make for a horrible case, uh, or a case of, that we're there for a long time trying to fix stuff. Um, so no, that's, that's absolutely two great points, uh, that I think, uh, as people begin to adopt these things, they need, they need experience number one, before they should do be attempting the lateral lay lift. And number two, communication, pre-op, intra-op, post-op. It, 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 it's paramount for these type of, type of cases. So. so, Lenny, I have to say that, you know, I love you, and you're, I have a lot of respect for you. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Lenny taught me how to do these cases, so I have a huge amount of respect. But I'm going to disagree with you on one thing that we've had okay. a conversation about so far. And what I, want, what I want him to say is that I don't believe that absolutely every – uh, indication for supine alif is the same for lateral alif, at least not in my hands, I have to say. I, I definitely think um, I am much more aggressive about trying more complex or challenging anatomies in the supine position, and I'm slowly becoming more willing to try them in the in the lateral position, but I, for example, will never do a you know, a discitis or a redo or, a, you know, a situation where I know for sure will be a very challenging case in a lateral position. And I just do think that I, I will try those and do fine. So I'm going to push back on you a little bit on that one. I, I actually would agree with you. And I, 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 when I say that mantra, it should be with a caveat that those kinds of cases I have yet to ever do. And other than a revision case with a T-lift, from the T-lift where there's some inflammation in the front side. I have not yet tackled an infected case, like a discitis case or an abscess, uh, or those, those types that have like venous stents in them, uh, where there's a lot of inflammation around there. I haven't yet done that. Um, and I, I would actually probably amend my statement and say that I completely agree with you. Those kind of cases in a supine position probably have uh, the incision is going to be bigger. You're going to have more exposure. You're going to have maybe a little more control where in the lateral position, your incision is going to be smaller. And if you make it bigger, it almost becomes a supine alif in a lateral position, you know, where you're, you're making incision really big and you're exposing. But I actually would agree with you. And I, I, I say that mantra as more of a diversion cases 
this slide just takes a little bit of a conversation about sort of indications and considerations. And, and just like Lenny said, you know, starting with the sort of uh, virgin L5S1 with widely splayed vessels and then progressing across this um, uh, spectrum. But there are some patients like the ones Lenny and I just spoke about that I really think are just not, uh, you know, are just a lot safer to be done in the supine position. Thank you, Lenny and Vanita. I think that was an excellent description of uh, the issues, concerns, risks, and uh, how general surgeons or vascular surgeons think through the issues of uh, accessing the spine anteriorly, and in particular with a lateral ALIF approach. Um, our experience has been very similar to yours, particularly at L5 S1. We found the uh, transition relatively simple Really, the approach, as you point out, is no different. So all the anatomic structures, all the concerns that we would have with supine ALIF are really unchanged by a, a lateral approach. Um, we, I would concur. I think it gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of our surgical planning. We have the ability to do L5, S1 uh, with a lateral position, allowing us access to more proximal levels laterally without having to change position, and then even screws in the lateral position. So it really facilitates the workflow, the efficiency of my case. And I think you've really done a, lot, a nice job describing uh, the surgical approach, what the unique issues are, and uh, how you guys went through your learning curve until you were very comfortable doing it this way. So let's now talk through ALIF access at L45. This has been an issue that for sure surgeons have been slower to adopt, um, largely because of uh, concerns about that level being more challenging, either with a supine ALIF or with a lateral ALIF. So I would be really interested in hearing your uh, perspectives, your learning curve, how you evolve, and how you approach L45 uh, anterior surgery from a lateral position in your practices. With that lead in, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Lenny. Thanks, Frank. You know, initially, uh, we sort of toyed with the idea, but we didn't really, really um, adopt it till we, we, Dr. Brawley and I went over uh, to Europe twice uh, to teach, and the Europeans were very interested in doing L405 along with 51 for cases that needed both done. And, uh, you know, we, we sort of talked about it and came back with that same sort of mantra, at least for virgin cases, of if you can do you know the four or five in the in the supine position. Why not? Why not? Why not do it in the lateral position? What's what's the downside? And there there are there are potentially some downsides, but we again tried to adopt that process of supine position. Why not lateral position? And the, one of the big advantages, obviously, workflow. So if you have a case where you need L four L five and L five S one done, and in the in in the traditional sense, we when we first started out, we were doing L five S one lateral ALIF, and then Dr. Brawley would do the L4, L5 ALIF, and then do the posterior screws percutaneously. And there were some cases where, you know, the, the crest may be too high. He can't get the ALIF retractors in, and even a crest line was not feasible because the crest was too big. And so um, what do you do in those cases? And so we, we, we attempted, but what we did was we actually started with cases where the bifurcation, the iliac artery and vein bifurcation was really high. So we, we were lucky and we got a couple of cases where the bifurcation was so high we could simply split the vessels both at L4, L5 and L5S1, which I said was more or less kind of cheating, but it, you know, it's, it's a gift when you get those kind of cases for two levels. And we were able to do those cases and sort of started out there with, you know, if we can do this now, how do you feel about mobilizing the vessels to the right of the spine like you traditionally do in a supine case? Um, and so we, we chose those cases very carefully. We looked at the anatomy. We looked at the, the patient. We chose, thinner, again, thinner patients, looked at the X-ray films and decided, okay, this, this looks pretty straightforward. The vessels are not calcified. Uh, they're, they're, uh, look very mobile. They're, they're way away from the spine, so they're probably easy to mobilize. Uh, and so there's a big fat plane between the vessels and the spine and, and, and so we, we tried those, those cases laterally by mobilizing the vessels across the spine. Uh, and, you know, I would argue that at least in the lateral position, the, the 
lateral iliac lumbar vessel and well as the segmental vessels are actually can be actually easier to see because you're looking straight at them on as opposed to looking down into a hole in the supine position. And and what I found was it it, it was it just as easy to ligate those vessels laterally as they are uh, in the supine position. And mobilizing vessels across the spine were uh, the same. It was pushing the vessel slowly across the spine, making sure it was mobile. Uh, and the same concerns for the left iliac vein injury apply no matter uh, which way you do it. Um, so from a radiographic standpoint, clinical history, the, the, the supine A-lift 4-5, I think, apply to the lateral. Uh, there's, I think, one major difference, uh, which Dr. Chandra probably will touch on and explain better than me, uh, the repair of the left iliac vein in the lateral position is a little different. Um, to me, the major difference is in the lateral position, you get, you get a lot of pooling of blood towards the posterior blade, which is where the vein sits. Uh, and so instead of being in a spine position where it's running away from the vein or going, there, there's a lot of pooling. And so in, in that case, what I've done is I, as opposed to having the posterior blade with the reverse tip on it, pushing the, the vein away, I usually change that blade for a, the, the, the same lateral blade that we use at 5.1 for the vein to pull the artery away and let the vein be more free. And then I use, I have two suckers. I use a sump sucker. To, to keep the pooling down in a directed sucker wherever the hole is. And we've had one case where we've had a small hole where I've had to fix, and, and I had to, to kind of work those things out in my mind on how to fix that four or five and keep the, the field free of blood so we could we could get a successful repair. But, you know, the, other than changing the way you have to do the repair, you, you, the visualization and the concepts to me are still the same as in the spine position for the most part. Okay, so, uh, you know, Lenny, I think that's uh, that's great, and you guys are really master surgeons. Um, I have a very different perspective, quite honestly. I'm not a fan. I don't do the L405, um, and I encourage or try to discourage um, my surgeons from doing them for a number of reasons. Um, my first thought is, quite honestly, I love the idea of enabling my surgeons um, to do more in you know, the lateral position, for example, and um, and me just doing one level. I think that's just the best use of my time. It's the best and most efficient situation. It's the most bang for your buck. Um, and so personally, I, I much prefer to do a one-level ALF, be in and out, than to do a multi-level ALF. I've also actually studied this, and we actually are um, about to publish it. We've submitted it for um, review. Um, we've looked at it in our supine patients that increasing number of levels in the anterior uh, um, uh, position is associated with a significant increase in morbidity, particularly in venous morbidity. And I think particularly that L4 or 5 level is the level that is, you know, oftentimes the most challenging, where we have the most involvement in mobilization of the vein and, um, and the most highest risk of some sort of injury or downstream complications, such as DVT. And we demonstrated this, at least in our supine patient population, um, in our recent study. You're absolutely right. The L405 disc space level is by far the most challenging supine or lateral uh, as far as complications, vascular injuries. It's the most, probably most difficult level uh, that carries the highest risk. Um, and and I, I would agree that, yes, uh, the multiple level A lifts and where I work in Oklahoma City, I've got multiple spine surgeons that, that schedule L2 to S1 supine A lifts. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm asked to expose, you know, four levels of spine uh, routinely because, because only really because we can do it, not because it makes sense to do one level and do the rest of them X lift because there's, there's a better way to do it, but that's that's what what they know, and that's what they want us want us to do. And 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 we've had the I've had those conversations with some of our spine surgeons about, hey, you know, there's 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 an easier way to do this with less risk of complication and vascular injury. Um, and adoption is sometimes slow, especially with sub sub surgeons who that's all they have in their armamentarium is either posterior or anterior. They don't have a lateral approach. They don't they don't really want to adopt it, uh, et cetera. And I've had those conversations even with some spine surgeons where they've had an L4-L5 A-lift done in the past and they want to do 2-3-3-4 three, three, supine in, in a spine position to adjacent level redo retroperitoneal approach where lateral would probably make more sense. Um, so absolutely, these are not cases that we're picking. And we've not done a ton of them. We've done a handful of them. 
um, where, if, say, for instance, the, the crest was too high and they couldn't get the L405, they couldn't do it laterally, uh, or, he, or Dr. Brawley couldn't do it laterally, uh, and, but it was a larger patient. We wanted, and the anatomy was favorable. So there was a lot of factors that, that factored into us attempting this. And, and, and again, um, the one thing I'll say is, uh, in any of my cases, whether it's supine or lateral, if I'm pushing on a vein, it's not going to give, or there's an issue where I think there's going to be a problem, we stop or we say, no, this is not a great idea, uh, or this is going to be a, a bloody mess if, 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 you, if you keep pushing. Um, so I just wanted to say I can't agree with you more. At the end of the day, the responsibility of the vascular status is ours, and if we think it's too dangerous, we need to say so. Again, patient selection is key. I think in doing any of these cases, uh, history and patient selection has, has, especially when you first do them, and even when you're done, you're doing your 200th one, patient selection matters. Couldn't agree with you more, Lenny. Uh, this has been fun. Back to you, uh, Dr. Phillips. It's been a real pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, both Lenny and Vanita. It's fantastic to have uh, two surgeons with your experience with uh, accessing the lumbar spine. Uh, to share their pearls and uh, learning curve through this process. Uh, from my point of view as a spine surgeon, I'm a regular ALIF surgeon. I've done ALIF for many, many years. I think we all understand the clinical advantages, including the excellent disc space preparation, leading to high fusion rates, uh, the unparalleled ability to create lordosis, and the relatively simplicity of, I'm going to say that the last thing again, and the relative uh, simplicity of this approach. It obviously takes a team and you need access surgeons who do this frequently and provide the exposure you need and do it safely and efficiently. Um, I think as I've worked through the transition to lateral surgery, uh, the learning curve at L5S1 has been very quick. Uh, obviously, first few cases, the access guy was a little nervous. He did the supine for many, many years. But literally within a couple of cases, it became second nature to him. And truly, it was the exact same approach he's done all that time with a patient in lateral position. He used the same approach, same instruments, uh, same retractors, essentially, uh, with really no downtime. So I think at L5S1, it's a very quick, easy learning curve. As we've discussed, L4-5 obviously takes a little getting used to, and I would certainly recommend in your practices, perhaps getting comfortable with 5-1 with your access surgeon comfortable at 5.1 before transitioning to L4.5. But when you think through it, really L4.5 uh, lateral ALIS, the approach, the risks are really essentially identical to those you'd have if you were performing this in a supine approach. It's really just a change of uh, mindset and getting comfortable with the fact you're working in a lateral position. I think for all of these approaches, whether you do these supine or laterally, it really is a partnership. You need access surgeons that know exactly what your surgical goals are, what you're looking for in the exposure, and they need to understand what your spine surgical goals are so they can help facilitate that. Um, I think you need experienced supine ALIF surgeons before they jump to doing these laterally. They need to be comfortable with the approach in general. And once you uh, meet those sort of prerequisites, it's a very easy transition for both the, sur the uh, access surgeons and certainly for the spine surgeon, it uh, really becomes a second nature and no different to performing these procedures in a supine position. I'd like to uh, thank, as I said, Vanita and Lenny for sharing their experience and all the uh, surgeons that participated in this webinar. I think this is an extremely exciting area that's evolving rapidly in spine surgery. And uh, I think it's incredibly helpful to have engaged uh, access surgeons to help us uh, better our approaches and uh, optimize our patient care and provide uh, better surgical solutions for our patients.